Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it might be. All I hope is that wherever you are, it's a little warmer than it was here last night, that depending on what you look at, was either plus 12 Fahrenheit or minus 12 Celsius. Neither one is particularly friendly. Why am I here? Got a lot of questions. Said it, it's not moving. We will have a quick, <laughs> can she make this thing? There we go. We figured out how to make it work. Nothing like an MIT education. Had a number of questions come in, and as I had hoped, a number of them frankly got beyond last week's, 10 days ago, session, and into some more general questions of what we've been talking about for the past six months. Let's try things, I'll do my best. This first group of questions is on licenses and agreements. And the first real question is, gee, if I'm licensing something and it goes beyond licensing, buying, selling, having somebody make something for me, do you want an express license, an implied license, or a mixture of both? I guess my advice on that one is always get an express license if you can. Because in an express license, you can spell out, and it's important for both sides of it, exactly what everyone's expectations are. An implied license is inherently inexact. How is it going to be interpreted? You never know. Why run the risk if you can actually get clear terms that tell you exactly what you're doing, what the license will be, when it ends, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. For example, and the next question gets into it, how should the license be structured to allow audits? I would hate to figure that out with an implied license. I've never heard of an implied license getting into the question of when does an audit come to play. So how do you structure a license agreement? You talk to your corporate attorney and you put in a set of clear terms that say what the audit is going to be. How often will it be, for example? And another thing is if you were, say, the licensor instead of a licensee, what information are you going to get about how the audit was conducted? Make sure it's what you think is a decent one. What information will you get when it's over? Will you just get, oh, they paid everything they were supposed to? Or you really get some detailed information so you can get behind the final conclusion and hopefully have the information that you want to be comfortable. I'm not saying for a moment that everybody in licensee is going to be out to cheat you, but everybody's going to be a lot happier if there is a clear understanding that people know what has been really going on. <clears throat> this question had to do with software licensing. As we talked about a week or so ago, the usual software license doesn't give you any ability to do much of anything with the stuff that you licensed. <clears throat> so people often do want to develop something internally or perhaps to hire a consultant to do it for them. Are there legal IP issues? To some extent, that depends on what the original license said. Beyond that, it depends on some copyright laws. You remember we looked at the Oracle case, et cetera, a while back. Can you copy APIs, et cetera? There is a problem of running into potential copyright problems. The biggest practical problem is going to be your third party licensor of the stuff that you bought the license has to be comfortable with the fact that you're doing things that you're allowed to do. Are you developing your own similar thing in a clean room? Are the people who are developing it people who know anything about the third party license? This is really the basic kind of advice is if you can avoid a problem in advance, do so. Don't create a situation in which you know somebody is going to ask questions and you know nobody's ever really going to be satisfied with the final answer. Last time we also got in to founders agreements in addition to a lot of others. We talked at last time about really how they would work in terms of IP, what can people do with the IP that they brought to a company, a founder, once they leave, maybe even once they're there, if they're shooting off in a somewhat different commercial direction. 
A founder's agreement, though, is hardly limited to IP. And here again is where you need a good corporate lawyer who deals with startups to tell you. For example, you're going to have to decide who owns what percentage of the business. Once the business is going, who's really going to operate? Who's going to be the CEO? Who's going to be chairman of the board? And who is not? What cash or other property is every person who founded expected to put in? How much time do they have to stay there? What are the incentives to keep them from quitting? And how do you handle things if and when they do? And as I've been told, and I think I mentioned a few weeks ago, it is most usual, not unusual, that all of the people who originally got going on starting this company don't stick around until it's actually going. People are going to leave really from the very beginning. They want to find something else they're interested in all the way to, you know, I've been here for five years and it's time to do something else. Final question on licenses and agreements was arbitration. And also, if you're going to sue to enforce an agreement, where do you go? This again is in large measure a function of what does the agreement say? You don't, once again, want to be in a situation of not having dealt with it, which just creates all kinds of problems on can it be arbitrated? Where can people be sued? So you want your arbitration, excuse me, your license agreement, not only to specify is there arbitration or is there not arbitration, but where is it going to be? And you want the parties to the agreement to agree that they'll be subject to jurisdiction, wherever it may be. If they're European and you're a US citizen, or a foreign citizen of Singapore? Is arbitration going to be in London? Is it going to be in Singapore? Is it going to be in New York? Spell that out in the agreement and spell out that people agreed, if it gets to court, that it can go to court there. In terms of enforcement, your goal is to come up with some type of judgment that can really be enforced. Arbitration, you can get that type of judgment if you've provided the right tools and mechanisms for enforcement, and I'm not an arbitration expert, talk to somebody more before you get in it. Court judgments similarly can be enforced in a lot of places if the whole process <clears throat> is handled in a way <clears throat> that admits to that. Broke or bankrupt? First question really deals with the situation, I think, but you know, the company I sued, frankly, doesn't have any assets. So I win. What am I ever going to get back? Well, unfortunately, that may not be a particularly unusual type of situation. There are a lot of small companies who don't have much in the way of assets. Their cash flow goes up and then it runs all the way down. It goes up a little, it runs all the way down. They have good sales and they have bad sales. So what do you do? Particularly, you've got to remember if you're in that little company, that is, again, as I think we mentioned, if you're somehow liable, not just for a royalty, but for lo lost profits, your lost profit award that you've got to pay somebody else could be more than your gross revenues might have been. Do you really have a chance of paying that? If you're the patentee, do you think you really have a chance of collecting it? The question here focused a lot on a shell company. And I guess that raised a couple of questions in my mind. The first one is, look, somebody other than the shell company, if there's real infringement, had to be involved. Very few shell companies have the machinery, the people, the resources to actually have manufactured or done what you're saying is infringing. Shell companies kind of by definition are precisely what it says, a shell. You've got to get down another layer. You've got to find the right defendant, the right infringer to go after. But no question, a lot of companies go broke, which kind of leads us to the second question on this slide. I license out all my IP. 
My company is attacked. Frankly, you license it to some third party country and guess what? They go bankrupt. Who gets the IP? If you've given, I'll say an exclusive license, you've given everything out to XYZ Corporation and it goes belly up. That's not a question this IP lawyer is going to try to answer in a way that you ought to really rely on it. But let me give you a few guidelines. The first is the bankruptcy laws differ a lot from country to country. And I won't even try to outline what they are anywhere other than in the United States. In the US, the basic procedure is when a company files for bankruptcy, a bankruptcy trustee gets appointed. And that person is in charge of either distributing assets, selling them off, or if the company reorganizes, to figuring out how to reorganize it and hopefully get everything going again. A license agreement is what's called an executory contract. What that means is it's ongoing. Royalties are due not only for the past, but it has some in the future, so it's still being executed. People are still doing what it talks about. This is unlike, perhaps, an agreement where you just bought, out, bought a new car, and except maybe for what you borrowed from the bank, the car itself, that agreement's all come to a close. It's no longer executory. But if there's an executory contract, the usual rule is that the trustee in bankruptcy has some choices. They can either say, you know, I like this contract. I want to have it as an asset for this bankrupt organization, and I want to be able to use it going forward. So we can accept the contract. He can also say, this contract is why we went bankrupt. I want no part of it. What do you do if you're the licensor? A lot of license agreements have clauses in them that say, okay, license automatically terminates if somebody goes bankrupt. There's a serious question in the United States at least is when that type of provision is effective. And the clear answer is it is not effective all the time that in a lot of circumstances, and I frankly don't know whether it's majority or minority depending how good contracts, the licenses were, the trustee can either accept or reject and you're stuck with what that trustee decides to do because you can't get out of the contract as the licensee. On the other hand, there is a rule, I understand from doing a little reading over the weekend to bring me a little closer up to date on bankruptcy, that if your license agreement is clear that the license can't be assigned, then it may be a little bit different and you may be able to terminate it if somebody quits. So the bottom line of this question is, would the IP revert to me? My answer, you've heard this too much, as you know, it all depends. But beyond that, don't count on the fact that it will, because it may not, and you may well be stuck with a license that you don't want. Or if you're a bankrupt person, you probably have some flexibility to say, either I want to try to keep this or to get this license off my back talk to a bankruptcy lawyer, not to a patent lawyer like me. Subject three, infringement. First question is what state has the most protection for victims of patent infringement? Well, I assume there we're talking about the people who own the patents, people who are bringing the suit for infringement. If there are any other victims, I guess the line's open, call in, uh, send in a question and tell me which type of victims you're talking about. Well, the first thing you have to remember here is that infringement, patent infringement, copyright infringement, not so in trademark, is a federal law question. State law doesn't apply. State law may apply to assignments of patents, but it does not apply to infringement. So the question in terms of patent infringement is typically not what state has the best law for me, but what state has the best judges? And there is no question that some states and some districts within states, Texas for instance has three or four districts, have a reputation for being much more patent friendly 
than others. The Eastern District of Texas, at least from the time I retired a few years ago in Marshall, Texas, close to Louisiana, had a reputation of being very pro-patentee that may have fallen off a little recently, but I can't tell you. Massachusetts, on the other hand, was not viewed as being particularly friendly. Delaware, I guess I'm not clear. I always viewed it as sort of being, you know, maybe straight, more straighter down the middle where it should be. But all I've done now is mention districts. What it really comes down to is, is who's the judge, who will obviously be affected to some extent by the culture of the district that he or she is sitting in, but has a fair amount of discretion. It's kind of like hiring a lawyer. Don't hire a firm. Hire the person who you think can do the job for you. Next three questions really all deal with what do I do if the infringer isn't in the US? How do I protect myself? For example, patent, first one, patents, US patent, I can order it online, sit into my desk right here, or you can use it in somebody else's computer, and it'll be shipped directly to me. You're the patentee. You don't want to bother to sue me. You're not going to recover anything, and there are too many of the me's around to give you any effective recovery. It's not worth suing customers. So how do you get back to the real problem, the person who put the product online in China, because they're the ones you want to stop. Can you sue them in the US? Well, there's a doctrine that says to be sued in the US, I have to have some type of quote, lovely lawyer words, minimum contacts with the US, which basically comes down to a quasi judgment call. Look, when you sold this product, you knew you were taking advantage of US law, US sales law, you knew you were talking to US customers, what's unfair about having you come here and having to defend? But let me change it just a little. Suppose the online person here, is it the manufacturer? just buys a lot from the manufacturer and can sell it anywhere and the manufacturer doesn't really care where. That makes for a different analysis and probably, or at least possibly a different result when what you're trying to do is to sue the manufacturer here. If you can find somebody here to sue, it's ordered online, it's being offered for sale in the United States, you can hopefully prove that. So you've got an infringement case against somebody. You also have the potential, if you can't find particular people, of going to the International Trade Commission, because as I think, hope I mentioned earlier, one of the things it does is issue orders that prohibit infringing products from coming in to the US. You don't get any money, but if you've got problems with who is bringing it in, and there may be a few, you have to get all the right names to the ITC, you have to win your suit there, but it's another possible route to take. But I'm not gonna tell you that any of these routes are cheap and easy. Products not yet being sold here. The second question bring is in sort of a different. Is it being offered for sale yet? Is it even made? Because if not, you've got a problem. There isn't yet any infringement by anybody you can talk about. Until the product has actually been offered for sale, advertised for sale, or imported, what does advertising infringe? And the answer is probably nothing. There may be some other route to go in terms of a false advertising claim, et cetera. I don't know, but I wouldn't bet on it. Obviously, as I mentioned, you get to the third, this can happen in steps. Manufacturer makes products for somebody else. The other person does it, makes it for somebody who has a license. It's probably fine, depending on what that other person's license actually says. Do they have a right to have stuff manufactured for them, or can they only manufacture it themselves? 
Manufacturers in the U.S. and everything, you're fine. It's been made in the U.S. Manufacturer is abroad. You didn't really want to ask this question. You remember we talked about a patent for a process of making something that is patented in the U.S. Process is here, but the product isn't. If it's made abroad, there can be infringement for infringing a process quest patent. It again is difficult to get the information to prove it. You can certainly hold the importer of a product if the product itself is patented in the U.S. libel, because importing is one of the things that's specified as being an infringement. Foreign, it is more complicated. And it's complicated not only on who is your defendant going to be, who are you going to go after, but it's also complicated because it makes it much more difficult to decide what lawsuit might be worthwhile, from whom are you likely going to be able to collect something, and what are you going to be really able to stop. It's very easy to go down the road in a piece of litigation and find after you spent far more money than you want to, is this going anywhere? When you have your specific facts, talk to somebody in a lot of detail, and they'll work through what is the, perhaps the best way to do it, what looks iffy, and frankly, things that probably won't work, at least not at a price or time frame that's acceptable to you. Expert opinions. Last thing on this slide. <clears throat> I mentioned they could limit damages if you were found to infringe. I think I probably tossed in, that means that the opinion that says you don't infringe and your patent's invalid is good only if it's wrong. But let's suppose that you have an opinion. Why did you get it? Well, there are two times you might be going after an expert opinion. An expert opinion usually means one that is written by a patent attorney who supposedly knows what's going on, and it's one that isn't farcical on its face. It better look like it's well-reasoned. The first time you're probably going to go after an opinion is when an investor asks, do you have the ability to do this without getting sued? That's long before litigation. And what gets involved there, and I think we probably talked about it in the first session, is taking a look at what the likely patents are out there that might give you a problem and trying to figure out what can I do, hopefully to eliminate, and at the very least somehow to reduce some of the risk. Those don't have to be written. As a matter of fact, they often aren't because it's a lot of back and forth. What, what is, what are all the moving bits and pieces, et cetera? May not be clean advice, but advice on that, which is an opinion, it can be useful. The next question is, okay, limit damages. What you're really trying to do there is make sure that if you're unfortunate enough that a court says you infringed a valid patent, what am I looking at in damages? And there's what's called willful infringement. And the problem with willful infringement is it leads to triple damages. Single are bad enough, triple are awful. So what do you have to do to avoid triple damages? Until probably eight or 10 years ago, the classic way and the focus was on, did you have an opinion? And if you had one, that basically got you your get out of jail free card. More recent cases, including at least one out of the Supreme Court and a couple have come out of the Federal Circuit, and they've moved around a little, is that the test is looking at what you did and look at it objectively, not in terms of, oh, I was told I didn't infringe, therefore I can't infringe. Your state of mind, recent decisions say, doesn't really matter. But objectively, was there a high likelihood that you were infringing? Or objectively, did you have a reasonable belief that either the patent was invalid or that you weren't infringing? But it's an objective outlook. The more recent cases have actually gone so said that you don't necessarily need an opinion, but an opinion, frankly, what's written and what might be said if people don't want to put it into writing, are opinions you don't really want to put into writing is it can help form an objective basis for thinking that you're all right. Opinions can be useful. 
They also can be less useful and a really good opinion, it's a lot cheaper than litigation, but make good use of it. Another issue that came up, and I think we talked about this to some extent before, but I'm not sure, is comes under the idea of priority. Under the Paris Patent Convention that covers most countries in the world, and within the Patent Cooperation Treaty, there's a procedure that you file your patent application in any of the countries that are members, and then you have within a year file in other countries. It, your one in the other countries is treated as though it had been filed on that date a year ago in the first country, so you claim what's called priority to that early application. In the US, for frankly, security reasons, secrecy reasons, there's a six month waiting period if an invention was made in the US before you can file that application in any other country. This is really tied closely, though it's different, you know, they follow different rules, to the export control rules that you may have run into on what in technical information, possibly secure, can I tell anyone who is not a US citizen? Make sure you remember they're different, look at them both. The priority six month waiting period, as I mentioned, doesn't assume US citizens. It's key, the trigger is, okay, where was the invention made? And if it's made in the US, that six months does come into play. If it wasn't made in the US, pause there a second. What happens if you cheat? Patent statute says you don't get a patent in the US. But let's suppose it wasn't made in the US. In that case, the US doesn't care when you file, and it frankly doesn't care much where you, whether you file anywhere else. But there are other countries that have similar, if it was made here, if it's our technology, we need to take a look before we can tell you to go elsewhere. So if you make your invention in Europe, if you make it in Asia, if you make it any other part of the world, check your local country's law to see whether it has something akin to this six months review period before you start filing that application in other places in the rest of the world. So if in other rest of the world, let's suppose I made my app invention first in Germany. I can file, and assuming Germany doesn't care, have a six month period. I can file a patent application on that invention in the US anytime I want to. I can file it in Canada, I can and then I can have it spring with the PCT, using that as a priority date to the rest of the world within the period of time the Patent Cooperation Treaty provides. The short answer to the question is the six month waiting period is exclusively for, for inventions made in the United States. The next question here really set me aback. What it seemed to ask was whether this US representative to WIPO was really saying that if I file an application in Korea, I can choose my filing date, past or present. I frankly have some trouble believing that that's actual the case. I can see, and I don't know, why a country like Korea might let you file it just to get it off your desk and tell me basically, I don't want to claim a priority date or a filing date until someday a little later. I have trouble believing that any country, and Korea would be one of them, that is deeply involved in the world patents world, is going to countenance people trying to backdate their applications and their priority date. I could be wrong on that, but it surprises me. And I'd really, I really, I need to talk to somebody a lot more to see exactly what people were told. My guess is there, if anything, there's you can choose a date somewhat in the future. As I said, I'd be really surprised if you can backdate it. Two kind of last questions, and then we'll see what you come up with during the session. 
I understand that inventors can be sued in the US for something related to their patents and inventions. Is this true? Perhaps if the end product created according to the specification fails to work in a safe manner. Well, how would an inventor be sued for something relating to their patent? The two ideas that first come to mind, and there may be others, is that inventor really stole it from you? <laughs> that might be why you would sue an inventor who got a patent, frankly, to get the patent assigned back to you, and closely related if the inventor had an obligation to assign to you, but had conveniently forgotten to do so. Whether the patent is safe, or the product the patent describes is safe, is really something the patent laws don't get much involved with. A lot of trade organizations, Federal Trade Commission, et cetera, get involved with safe products, but that's really a little beyond the purview of the patent process. Do I get my patent out of the patent office and who can I sue later? Though if you sue somebody and it's not safe and the FTC has said so, that's gonna make for a much more interesting lawsuit. A patent doesn't warrant in any way that the products here are safe. If, however, there may be an agreement with a manufacturer that says so, and you're the other party to that agreement, you probably might have a claim, but it would be based on your contract and not on the fact that it's all a patent. That the specification doesn't tell you how to make it work in a safe manner is a little different question. Because you recall that the patent statute tells you you have to tell people how to make and use your invention, at least people who are skilled in the field. Doesn't say you've got to teach them how to use it safely, but you do have to teach them how to make and use it. And if it doesn't do that, then the patent's invalid for failure to meet the patent laws enablement clause. Beyond that, the fallback is really once again going to be is there a manufacturing agreement involved, non-patent, where the patentee who licenses you warrants again that it's safe, or at least it can be made to be safe? Here again, we're probably talking about what is the implied license? What are the conditions of it? I don't know of a clear answer, but it's not typically a patent law question. I really liked the last question here because it really brings us full circle all the way back to lecture number one, session number one. There is an overlap between patents, copyrights, tape secrets, and trademarks. They don't completely Venn diagram overlap each other. But there are areas in which more than one type of protection might be available. Typically, the overlap breaks down between your utility patent on the one side that is clearly directed to how something works, pure functionality, and copyrights and trademarks on the other side that may protect both design features appear, appeal to the potential consumer because God, isn't this pretty? Or maybe as a trademark because yeah, I know that's a Coke bottle because no other bottle has that shape. But there is also some functionality built in. The question ends up breaking down if you're looking at the potential enforcement of a trademark, a design patent, or a copyright, is how functional. There is not, unfortunately, a clean test. Different courts seem to apply different tests, and somewhat different tests are applied with respect to, say, copyrights as opposed to trademarks. What are some of the tests? Well, I'd like to take the first one here. It used to be patented. I'm a purist. 
As far as I'm concerned, I'd go back to some old Supreme Court decisions and say, if this damn thing was patented, once that patent is expired, it's fair game. The courts more recently haven't gone that far. They have permitted some functionality to creep in without destroying the protection that you would get from your design patent, trademark, or copyright. So what's the test? One test you hear is this functionality, this feature that makes it functional. What is it that makes the Coke bottle better? Essential to make it a bottle that looks like this. Does it affect cost or quality? Now there's a nice open question. Are there other ways to do it? Lots of arguments to be made between your lawyer and all the other people's lawyers as to exactly where that line is. Some trademark cases seem actually to have drawn what is probably a pretty good line, but you recall the trademark is not supposed to protect products. It's only supposed to make sure when you buy a product, you know where it came from. So the question that some trademark courts are asking may be perhaps a little broader and perhaps functionality to be protected. If I don't let other people do this, what's the disadvantage to competition? And that's really a question we need to go all the way back to through all of this when you start balancing what's IP going to give you? What can it protect? What might it protect? Because it's, all of this is based on policy. And when you get down and start looking at it, how important is competition compared to the importance of protecting patentees in their inventions, of protecting trademarks from being appropriated. The whole system is a balancing act. And I guess one of my goals here has been simply to help people recognize that it is a balancing act, and that although there are some rules that are fairly clear, there's always an overlay of what looking at the way you want the economy and science and advancement to work is the right thing to do. What's come in? <laughs> All righty. So we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, let's see. The first one is, can you please give a brief overview of the differences between copyright, copyleft, and the Creative Commons project? Oh boy. <laughs> copyright means, damn it, I have the right to control copying. Copy left starting point is, and this goes back quite a while, just Dan Brinkland started a lot of it, of, you know, software shouldn't be copyrighted. It should be free for everybody to use. We don't want limited on what people can copy, at least in some fields. The economy, the market, the world would be better off if people put this stuff out to be used to be built upon to make better stuff as opposed to reserving rights to the person who happened to get the first copyright in the field. Common cause copyright is sort of in the middle. I forgot that set of notes I had in this notebook until uh, last night sometime. It has a variety of standard-ish contracts. I think there are about eight of them. And they vary from contracts that will say, I give up all copyright and anybody can do it. They have contracts and I think all of them do that if you're going to copy something, there has to be attribution. But its purpose for being is to come up with simplified basic contracts under which other people will be able to use what you've copyrighted. There are limits on them. Some of them are fairly light. Most of them, frankly, in common cause, don't give the copyright owner anywhere near the protection and the right to control that he or she would have in the absence of a common cause type of copyright. But they're looking at it from the other side is how important is it to get this out? And I think the last time I looked, there are an awful lot of those agreements out there in effect 
and they have to be authorized by the copyright owner, and they all are, have the goal of increasing the use of the intellectual stimulus and thought that's gone into that copyright. Great. Um, the next one also deals with open source licenses. So of the <laughs> common open source licenses, Apache, BSD2 and 3, GNU, GNU, LGPL, MIT, and Mozilla, which are the most restrictive and which one is the most liberal? You know, I would love to be able to answer that question. <laughs> I've done a number, worked with a number of people here at MIT in courses, and there is a woman who I guess is now retired from Choate Hall and Stewart, Karen Copenhagen, and this is her life. <laughs> if you can find her email, she is the one to ask that question because she has spent most of her practice dealing with the various levels of copyright, open software, what can you do? It raises all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems. You need to understand, unfortunately, a lot better than I can explain it to you on what you can or can't do. The goal in all of these is to make it possible at some level for people to use openly software that previously existed. But as you indicated in that question, they're all different. And I apologize, I just can't get into detail because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. The next one is, yesterday pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical executives testified before Congress over a drug oh, yes. crisis, <laughs> a drug called Humira. Humira? Um, Humira. Humira. I saw some of this testimony on the news last night. <laughs> 20 billion in yearly sales, has 136 patents. It has a simple, uh, it has a simple molecule that treats different conditions. Is it possible to get a patent for each of the different treatment applications a single drug or molecule can provide? Well, let's just say the exec who basically said they had 136, if I remembered correctly, was asked, does this mean you can get a separate patent on each potential application? And his answer, as I understood it, was basically yes. I think the question that was then followed up by one of the senators sitting on the panel was really directed to another senator on the panel because the two of them were both on the Senate Judiciary Committee that deals with patents. And his statement slash question was, you know, I think this is something we need to look into. And I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Got it. Let's see. And then when applying for SWIP, does the US Patent Office require me to hire specialists to see through my project source code to identify percentage of open source code dependence within my application? I think you might mean software. Yeah, I think it's software. I yeah. okay, read the question again then, because I think we're getting into a couple of different areas. When applying for software IP, okay. does the US Patent Office require me to hire specialists to see through my project source code to identify percentage of open source code dependence within my application? My understanding is no. The patent office, and this is actually a somewhat broader question than that, all they're looking at for is, is the prior art such that what you are doing is not obvious? They don't care whether you're infringing anybody else. That's all left to court. Looking at the infringement, do they care whether your product is within the scope of some other patent's claims? No. As far as I know, they don't care where you actually got this. If your patent application is full of trade secrets you've stolen, they're not going to look at it. Their view is it'll certainly come up if you get into eventual litigation down the pike, but all the patent office looks at is here is the prior art. Not all, it gets a little beyond that, but not much. The basic question, look at here's the prior art. If I look at all this prior art, is what you're claiming new and non obvious? And that's the extent of the inquiry, and it's all they really care about. Got it. And then our last question, our second to last question, um, with respect to the infringement slide, is an IP lawyer the typical person I should seek for an expert opinion? If it is, it sounds that as if an IP lawyer is the one that must submit my IP application in the first place. Is it a part of the pre-IP application internal investigation? Am I correct? Okay. Do you need an IP lawyer, let me start with the beginning, to submit your application? 
patent office has a rule that you can't practice before the patent office unless you have passed their test and received a registration number. To take their test, you're required to have some specified, it's a long laundry list, but it doesn't include everything, of technical backgrounds, though sometimes you can get past an on-the-job training, and you have to pass a test that deals with a lot of the patent office rules and the basics. So effectively, your application has to be submitted by a patent attorney. That does not mean that the patent attorney has to write the whole thing. In a lot of cases, if you go to a firm, a lot of it will be written by people who aren't yet patent attorneys. They may be technically trained people who are learning. And as I think I mentioned, the more writing that you can do, the cheaper the patent application is likely to be. And okay, there are a couple other parts of that. Let's go back to them. Yes, so let me just, <laughs> let me read it again. With respect to the infringement slide, is an IP lawyer the typical person I should seek for an expert opinion? Answer, you need to seek someone who understands what the patent law is. I, when I started out, frankly, one, I started out in a patent firm here in Boston. And I'll tell you, the best patent lawyer in that firm, when I started out, I don't want over 50 years ago, had a BA in English. But he was a patent lawyer. He had gotten his registration number. I don't think somebody who has not practiced in the field is going to be able to give you an opinion that will deal with the nuances, because frankly, there's a fair amount of background knowledge that's necessary to know what are the applicable laws, what are the gray areas around them. So I think the short answer to your question is, yeah, you do need an IP lawyer, and hopefully you want one with some experience. Yeah, okay, great. And then um, I would ask if it is possible to discuss details of an invention with a potential investor before filing a patent application. The problem, a problem, there's never the problem you're going to run into here, is very few investors will ever sign anything approaching a non-disclosure agreement. There is a risk that if you disclose to a potential investor, you have now, as far as the patent law is concerned, disclosed your invention. You have some protection in the U.S., for a while. Technically, as long as it's your disclosure, if, if he passes or she passes it on, they, when they're passing it on, doesn't turn what your disclosure was into prior art here. It well may turn it into prior art, in fact, you disclosed it without confidentiality in a lot of the rest of the world. Practically, how do you handle this? It's not easy. My usual advice is the best way to keep something a secret is never to tell it. So be very careful of what you disclose. And if you're dealing with somebody reputable, I think the chance that they will disclose it is probably relatively small. That doesn't answer the question of if it becomes known that you did disclose, does that create a disclosure problem abroad? Closely related to this is what do you do when you submit an idea to a company? And I'm familiar with what used to be Gillette, now owned by Procter & Gamble's policy was, is that we won't accept an idea that's not patented. We simply won't take it, we won't discuss it, we won't look at it, because we're in so many different areas, we've got our own labs working, we've discovered that it's not worth running the risk of somebody coming in and saying we disclosed it to you, when in reality, we didn't use anything we might have told it. And there are a number of companies that unless and until it's patented, simply won't talk to you. At least they won't talk to you on anything approaching a uh, confidential basis. And then our last one, uh, what tests should founders use to test if there's a patentable software, especially when most platforms are cloud-based? I guess basically I'm going to answer that kind of two ways to look at it. Question number one is if you're the software inventor, you're developing this, what is it you really want to patent? Okay, have you sorted out what it is you want to patent? Is it something 
that at least the courts in this country are going to accept, and the patent office, frankly, your biggest job is to get a patent in the first place, are now accepting as, quote, patentable subject matter. We talked about this, again, quite early. A rule that seems to be developing is if the software is directed to how to do something simply using a general purpose machine, it's not patentable. If the patent is directed to how do you make this machine work better so it's possible to do this, what makes it possible to do it may be patentable. Second, I'd love not to keep these simple, is that of course the rules are different abroad. <laughs> so what are you trying to patent? Can it be patented? And then figure out what's the best way to go about it? What did I miss? Got it. Go on, go back and read the question. Uh, so it just, it, I think you answered all parts of that. So I think you're all set. Um, so I think those are all the questions that we got. Great, and again, I uh, thank you very much. The next session, as I th think I mentioned last time, we are, I've invited a woman from the MIT Council Office who has a fair amount of experience at MIT and before that at Harvard and I forget where else in how do universities deal with patenting, licensing of inventions that are basically made through research. I've spent some time talking to her. It's going to be interesting. This is very close to my farewell, but you've got one more hour of listening and another hour of questions to go. So hope to have you here. And that will be on March 19th, um, I believe also at noon. So stay tuned for more.